<laughs> Kau sekuat ni? Ya, yeah, kau sekuat. So Michael, pleasure to have you here. Can you start uh, with a sentence just introducing yourself, your name and what you do? Okay, well my name is Michael Shea and I am a teacher and a practitioner of cranial sacral therapy and I've been practicing as a manual therapist and a cranial sacral person for probably 30 years now. I would like to understand how your way of working changed? How did you start with craniosacral work and where are you at now? Well, it's an interesting story. I mean, I started off actually as a massage therapist in the United States and practiced massage therapy and related uh, tissue work for several years. And actually, when I was actually in massage school, I heard the word cranial work. And I knew it's like a light bulb went off in my head. I want to learn that. And so I did everything I could to learn it but nobody was teaching it. And this was back in the early 70s. 
And finally, I found someone that took me under his wing, a beautiful old cranial osteopath that had actually worked with Dr. Sutherland. And his name was George Nargang. And he taught me the very early parts of the cranial work, which was the mechanical part of pressing on bones and lifting bones and seeing their effect on the brain and the nervous system and the relief of symptoms from that. How was your understanding of the healing back then? Well, the healing back then for me was very simple. I mean, if someone felt better at the end of a session, in other words, if their symptoms got relieved, um, if they felt a little bit better, then we did a good job and I got a paycheck and could pay my rent. But how did you explain back then why the healing happened? Well, actually, that, that actually has to do with several factors. Um, some people come to get cranial work because they have symptoms or they have some type of a disorder and they want to get some relief. And some people actually come for the work because they want to explore their human potential. Um, they're working with other types of therapy. Uh, they're working towards their own self-development and they want to be able to explore their body. And so I actually had exposure to two different paradigms from the very beginning, where a whole half of my practice was working with people that wanted to explore their body and their mind, their spirituality. And then the other half, uh, including a lot of infants and children, were under a great deal of stress. Um, the adults as well, suffering from all sorts of stress-related disorders. And of course, uh, lately in my career, these disorders are disease processes now. I hear a strange sound here, so I just have to... How did your work, how was the, your personal evolution in the 30 years doing this work? Oh, well, that's a big story. Uh, my personal evolution, you know, has to do with my own personal process, because from the very beginning, as a massage therapist, I studied Gestalt therapy and other types of therapy um, that were for my own self-development. So from the very beginning, I was accustomed to receiving body work for my own development and also in therapy for my own development. And it turned out uh, that the reason for this is that when I got out of the military, I had a case of what is called post-traumatic stress disorder. And so I needed a lot of help, and I needed work on my body, and I needed work on my mind. And it just coincided that I made a career out of it, especially with manual therapy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do you work today as a craniosacral therapist? What do you do and what don't you do anymore? Oh, well, I work very, very differently now. Um, I just did a session on a, a friend of mine, a psychotherapist uh, who had a very uh, significant injury. She fell off a, a bike and broke her hand and then had, it was very debilitating all summer for her. And I had done a session on her when she had a bad neck, sore neck, maybe 12 years ago. And I did a session on her and what she told me last week was that my work had radically changed. That 12 years ago, she felt that I had done a session on her and that last week, she was able to actually be a part of the session and um, go into the session and allow the healing in her own body to participate. That she could actually be an active participant in the session. And then she said something very interesting. She said, I felt I was in communion with you and the frequency that you were creating as a result of the session. So I would say that's the main difference is that now I work in a way that I'm in communion with the client, and the client actually gets to participate at their own level. And is the work, you, the way you do it now, more effective? Well, that's um, a really interesting question. It's more effective for me because as I've aged and as I've grown, I've become more subtle, and I've realized that less is more. And so I think for the type of clients I have, whether it's an infant or a child or an adult, that absolutely um, the work is improved and the results I get um, are definitely an improvement. Craniosacral therapy is becoming more and more known um, some, at some places almost like a fashion, but what 
is the difference between, in your words, biomechanic and biodynamic craniosacral work? Well, it, it actually just represents the evolution of the work from the original founder, Sutherland. He went through three basic phases in his life. And so we're talking about William Garner Sutherland, who was an osteopathic physician from about 1901 uh, to about 1954. And his explorations included the development of a manipulative technology or hands-on work that worked just with the bones. And then he discovered that there was something deeper, uh, a deeper what he called motivating force, in which he then developed a whole technology for the membranes around the brain and in parts of the body. And then shortly before he died, he actually felt a force on the inside of the body that was actually doing the healing, and he had nothing to do with it. And so he changed the entire model towards a biodynamic approach where it was extremely light touch, and the attention of the practitioner had to be sacralized, or it had to be with a great deal of reverence and respect, are his words. Very interesting. So does it mean the more you develop your skills and understanding, the less you physically, actively do? Absolutely. Absolutely. There was a very interesting piece of research that was done at the University of New England College of Osteopathy probably uh, about 10 years ago. And they wanted to really find out, okay, so some cranial people say you get results with this one fast rhythm in the body that's in the brain, and other people say it's a slower one. So they got 10 cranial osteopaths in a room. They wired them up with all sorts of computer things on their, their heads and everything. And then they had a patient on the table. And they put a little button on the leg of the massage table by the knee of the practitioner. And they told the practitioner, every time you feel the rhythm change directions, in other words, the rhythm of health in your body change directions and change directions in the client, just take your knee and tap the side of the table. Well, guess what they found out? The young people, the younger cranial osteopaths, all tap the knee for the faster rhythm. And the older ones, the more experienced cranial osteopaths, didn't tap their knee for a long time because they were feeling something much more subtle, much more deep, and much more um, lengthy, so to speak. Can you explain if, in a few simple words these three rhythms and how you work with them as a craniosacral therapist? Well, in the study of the human body, we have to understand that there are many, many, many rhythms in the body. Cells have particular rhythms, uh, very fast ones that they open and close to let nutrition in, and then larger clusters of, of tissue, uh, physiology, all sorts of uh, different parts of the body all have different rhythms. And then there are global rhythms. So basically, the cranial osteopathic community, and then of course the cranial sacral therapy community, has decided on um, the attention going to three different types of rhythms. A fast one, and that's really associated with what's called the autonomic nervous system. And that's really the system that manages stress and it speeds things up in the body. So there's this thinking that if you synchronize your attention with this fast rhythm, then that, that will help um, the person. And then they have, science has now found slower rhythms in the brain in particular called a mid-tide rhythm. And we have found that that rhythm also is very valuable to synchronize attention with because it allows the brain to relax. And then the slower rhythm has actually been found throughout the body uh, in all the fluid compartments of the human body and seems to be associated with a much deeper healing response because the way it actually keeps the entire body connected, every single part of the body, every single cell is connected to this one rhythm. Which rhythm do you like to work most with? Um, I'm over 60 years old now, so I like the slow rhythm. <laughs> Absolutely. I have found that that is the most beneficial um, because it teaches me the most. When my attention is on the slow rhythm, I actually get a learning. It, it tells me and directs my attention um, to where to look in my own body, even while I'm working, in order to slow down. And then it actually tells me where to look in the client's body. 
Let's talk a little bit more about the work um, of a therapist and how to become a therapist. Do you need to have a special talent to learn this? No, I think you need to have an open heart and I think you need to be willing to, to be lighthearted. What does that mean? Well, I think, I think there's a great deficit in our country and our culture right now and I think there's a great lack of, of humor um, and lightheartedness. And I think that the antidote to the fear that many people experience in many countries, um, and certainly many clients come in experiencing a lot of fear, whether it's about their job or their finances, that the antidote to that is providing a sense of lightheartedness and a sense of open-heartedness. And it turns out that when you put your attention on a slow rhythm, that your heart feels lighter and you actually feel happier. And so, actually, you could say that this is an empathy-based model of work, mm -hmm. uh, the slow rhythm work. What is your vision uh, about the therapy training in Cyprus? Ah, Cyprus. Well, it's a, it's a beautiful vision because the cranial sacral therapy is now worldwide. You can find it throughout the whole Pacific Rim, throughout North America. It's moving into Central and parts of South America. And really the last uh, major part of the world, um, other than Africa, is the Middle East. So it makes a great deal of sense to come here to Cyprus, which is the, the, the center point for the continent of Africa, for the European continent, and for the entire Middle East. It's a beautiful central point uh, that we could have this type of unification between Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. How do, will this training look like? How will this training look like? Well, right now, um, the traditional training that's offered, uh, let's say in North America or Great Britain or Europe, is a 700-hour training that involves 10 levels. Each uh, level of training is approximately four or five days with a massive amount of homework all of which is necessary for someone who already has a background um, in manual therapy or has training in anatomy and physiology. So we're going to change the whole training around and actually do it in two parts because we want to simplify it, number one, because it needs to be simplified, uh, and make it easier for people to attend so that we can give them the information they need um, and apply it right away so that they get it in their hands um, with a certain amount of homework, um, but the homework is associated with doing practice sessions and not have to worry about a lot of reading. So we will call this, uh, or I would call it what is called an applied training, where we apply all the information, all the theory, and we put it in their hands, get it in your body, and apply it to the client. What will the students of this training in Cyprus learn? What kind of skills will they develop? Well, the focus that I have um, is in the new science areas. And the new science areas talk about um, focusing on the heart um, as a way of changing the brain and increasing empathy, love, and compassion. So we are going to orient this entire training um, around a heart-centered training where we actually put attention on the heart as a felt sense in the body. We put attention on the blood, the slow rhythms of the body, and that generates empathy. And we want to be able to have students that can generate a tremendous amount of empathy to support the peace process that's going on, not only here in Cyprus, but throughout the Middle East. And it's not just the Middle East, it's throughout the entire world. So what we're going to do is have a heart-centered training uh, that's focused on love and compassion and all the new science that's associated with how to promote love and compassion through the body, through the use of human touch, through the use of cranial sacral therapy. What will people, students who finish the training, what will they be able to work with in their daily practice? Well, um, typically in cranial sacral therapy, um, we're going to learn how to put our hands on different parts of the body. And so in terms of what the people will be able to do one-on-one -on -one with a client is certainly, first of all, come into relationship with their stress and relieve stress and lower stress in the client. 
because there's a lot of that. The second thing it will be able to do is interface, or at least wise, begin making changes in the central nervous system and the cardiovascular system so that people can begin not only lowering their stress, but becoming happier and sharing that happiness and being happier with other people. It's very interesting. What is the difference between the work of a craniosacral therapist and someone who is doing healing like Reiki or something like this? I think all of these uh, technologies or these hands-on work, um, anything that involves hands-on basically is all um, related in the same way. Um, that this work is based on love um, and very heart-centered compassion and the hands-on turns out to be related to the mother's touch. The new science says that when you put your hands on someone very lightly, whether it's Reiki or whether it's a mother with a newborn baby or whether it's a cranial sacral therapist, that this enters into and activates certain parts of the brain and the heart that wake up the memory of being nurtured, cared for with a great deal of love when you couple it to a slow rhythm and a slow tempo. That's the key in the training. So slowness is healing. Correct. Being slow um, and becoming still uh, is actually very healing. And it allows you to move your attention. And once you become slow and you become still, then you learn how to move your attention you know, towards the client, towards an area of stress, and the healing becomes instinctual as a result of being able to slow down and become still. How would you describe this stillness in the craniosacral work? Well, stillness is actually um, not anything mystical uh, at all. As it turns out in growth and development, when you're a baby, uh, ask any mother, because the German word for breastfeeding is stillen, to become still. Every mother knows that if that baby is going to grow and develop, there needs to be a certain sense of stillness, especially when it's breastfeeding. And it turns out that that's true in fetal development and also in embryonic development. When we're just the size of a little lentil, we have a cardiovascular system, and we have a metabolism that's built around stillness. There's areas in the embryo and in the fetus that are actually very still that contribute to the correct and normal growth and development, not only of the central nervous system and the heart, but also the entire body. So you absolutely need stillness to grow and develop, scientifically, absolutely. I'm going to turn off the light here. <laughs> and you don't say a word that I told you that no, no, either. No, 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 of course not. Of course, I would never think she's too old for that. Um, yeah, can you maybe say uh, a few words about what will be taught on the different levels? Well, the, the first level has to do with learning about the therapeutic relationship. So the therapeutic relationship involves how you manage your own body and your own posture, and also then how you come into relationship with the hands-on, and how you negotiate the contact with the client so that they feel safe. So the first part of the training is learning how to establish safety and trust between two people. And that also means between the people in the group or the students themselves. Now, we will teach uh, a series of hand positions that you can then use with a client as sort of like an opening type session to do with clients. And those hand positions involve usually uh, the feet, uh, the sacrum, the shoulders, uh, and the lower back, and sometimes the neck. But, and so we go around the body. I like to say we circumnavigate the body. We go around it in a circle, put our hands on, and then focus our attention on our own heart and our own body. And then we wait until we feel ourselves in that way that we can feel a lot of our own wholeness physically. And then we negotiate contact to make 
uh, put our hands on the client. So this is level one, relationship and different way of touching. Different way of touching and also we spend a lot of time in the practice of paying attention to a slow rhythm because that's the foundation of the training is learning about the slow rhythm and how it feels in your own body first because the nature of the training is the therapist has to feel this slow rhythm in their body first. It's not about doing something to the client. We put our hands on the client and then we become completely receptive. The key to this work is becoming receptive to allowing the client to flow into you as the client naturally will because that's what nervous systems and cardiovascular systems do. And then there's a flow back out. And so we, we learn how that the therapeutic relationship is like a circulatory system. It's beautiful. What is on, in level two? In level two, we focus a lot of attention on the heart itself and the, all the different ways in which the heart grows and develops and all the different hand positions having to do with making more space for the heart. And that means more space for the nervous system and that means uh, relieving the stress that's held in the heart and the entire cardiovascular system, all the blood um, and the arteries and veins throughout the body. And so the, the hands-on work uh, is oriented that way. Why is the heart so important for you? Well, the new science is very clear that when you put attention on the heart, you consciously, and the, the key word here is you consciously pay attention to the heart, that it changes the brain's structure and it actually improves the way in which you process strong emotions. So in other words, it is a protocol for compassion. The science says that you actually increase empathy for another person when you as a therapist put attention on your own heart. And so it's very, very important. And so many people in our culture hold deep, deep issues in their heart, whether it's from their family, their partners, um, wherever it might be. And so these issues need to be focused on first mm -hmm. because that's what's going to change the brain. Mm -hmm. Then in the third level, we go to the brain. We go to the head and we show the way in which the head develops. And then we show the way in which the head develops in relationship with the brain and then the face. It turns out in development that the face is located between the heart and the brain. And of course, this is a time of our life I'm talking about before birth. And we have to learn these basic relationships between the head, the face, and the heart. So that's really about the first three modules. Mm -hmm. How many more modules will there be? Well, we are aiming to have five modules. Um, and the fourth and fifth module will be about completing the tour around the body, and specifically the extremities. It's very important to learn how to work with the arms and the legs uh, in terms of the way that they hold stress. Mm -hmm. And then in the final module, uh, doing a lot of work uh, around the visceral area and especially the umbilical area because that's where we originally received nurturing and love through the umbilical cord from our mother. After these five levels, will one be um, ready to work as a craniosacral therapist or Will, will you, is this just a basic training and will there be more? Well, absolutely. We intend that after the first module that you can go out and start working on practice clients. However, um, ethically, by the end of the fifth training module, we feel competent uh, and clear that our graduates, after five modules, can go out and work on the public uh, quite safely. Now. That being said, we also understand that throughout North America and Europe, there are much higher standards where you have to take 10 levels of training. And this is because of government regulations, uh, political considerations with associations, uh, and all of that. We have found in our own experience, though, that if we do the training just right and we have the right uh, teachers, teaching team, and students, that after five modules, we'll be able to uh, feel quite uh, good about public safety because that really is our job is to ensure public safety and if students want to go on for an entire foundation training because let's say they might want to move to England to practice 
then we can also provide a bridge training for them in order to do that. This is available throughout Europe. It's called a bridge training, and it would provide the second five levels of training uh, to begin to work in another country that has a higher standard. But what you are basically saying that these five levels are, you can get the people to a point where they are at the level where they can work just as well as after 10 levels. Well, I, I'm not sure sure about that um, because uh, there's different, these standards are, are generated um, and it means that in different countries the standards have a different curriculum. See, we're going to teach a curriculum that we're sure because of our experience. They can, you can go out and work on the public after five modules. Politically, let's say in Great Britain where they've had an association now for over 20 years, the 10 modules has a curriculum that hasn't changed much over time and is, is steeped in the necessity of keeping the curriculum even amongst many, many schools. So it's difficult to uh, change a curriculum. We're going to modify the curriculum, uh, make it easier. We're going to remove a lot of material that I can tell you personally is not being used by anybody that graduates from 10 level trainings. And that way when we eliminate the material that's not being used, that's unnecessary, and we stay with an applied training, we can con condense the training into five modules and ensure public safety. Absolutely. So it's rather an advantage than a disadvantage for people. I would say it's a huge advantage. It's a huge advantage that we don't already have a cranial association in Cyprus. I've been a consultant to several uh, associations. I have started two associations myself and very rapidly it becomes very difficult to actually become creative with the work. So this is why we have a lot of freedom here in Cyprus and in the Middle East. And our intention is to stay uh, with this freedom and this creativity. Your vision in 10 years, how many therapists would you like to have, have well, trained in Cyprus? Uh, after 10 years, um, if we do start a training every year uh, and then we graduate a training every year starting in two years, um, we're looking at exponentially possibly 20 to 30 per year. So the mathematics on that would be, you know, over five years, possibly 100 to 150 therapists. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would like to mention or stress or are you happy with what has been said by you so far? Ah, no, I think uh, what I've said is, is really important because uh, we have a lot of freedom and creativity. Mm -hmm. The new science is very clear that if we focus on our heart, we can have this protocol for compassion, and that's actually what we're going to teach mm -hmm. within the context of this model and make sure that everyone feels safe and trustworthy of the work. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Perfect timing. The tape is just finished now. Okay.